Coming up in Animalia, we pay a visit to Arabia's Wildlife Centre. Lots of babies, some who are man-eaters, but are going bald. A friendly gibbon rescued from 18 years of captivity. A new exercise toy for two amorous polar bears. A hungry pair of lynx cubs thriving in their new home and hopefully perpetuating the species. And a Dalmatian who kindly poses as a surrogate mum to four very hungry lion cubs. All that and more coming right up. A small office run by the Tolba family sells unusual goods in Abaru Wash, a small town in the western desert on the outskirts of Cairo. Whenever possible, Abdel Halim Tolba, 39, and his sons leave Abaru Wash and head for the desert to hunt down fresh supplies. Finding a likely bush, Abdel Halim scratches away the earth where snakes like to escape from the heat of the midday sun. Not all snakes are found in bushes though. The viper, one of Egypt's most venomous snakes, buries itself in the sand to keep cool. Besides snakes, the Tolba family hunt everything they find in the deserts. Scorpions, reptiles, spiders and various insects. The family has buyers scattered all over the world, ranging from Sweden to the United States. Scorpions also require a high level of skill and concentration, although Abdel Halim says he's been stung so many times by scorpions that he's almost immune to them. Most of the Tolba snakes and scorpions are kept at clinics under supervision to maintain their health in order to produce high-quality venom for making serums. It's late afternoon at the Tata Ranch in southwestern Kenya. The ranch is located between two national parks, Savo East and West. While the thorny trees make perfect hiding places for animals, they make it difficult for visitors to view the wildlife. But these people won't give up easily. They've come from all over the world in the search of the legendary man-eating lions of Tsavo. It's not just their tendency to attack humans that makes these lions unique. They look quite different from other lions. The males either have no mane or relatively small ones. They're also extremely possessive and don't accept the presence of other males in their pride. Other lions don't readily attack buffaloes. These ones are aggressive enough to do so. Bruce Patterson, an American biologist, heads a team of researchers that are observing the Tsavo lions. Lions are constantly crossing into human dominated areas and in those areas they cause great havoc and tragedy when they attack people and stock. In 1896 135 railroad workers were killed by lions. No one then could explain the attacks. All they knew was that the killers had no manes. John Lacoro and other cattle herders have lost three cows to lions recently. John was attacked by the lions himself and suffered this scar. Samuel Kasiki, a Kenyan biologist, is a member of the research team. His main role is to interact with Savo's human community. The dialogue has highlighted a growing problem. Patterson, Kasiki and the team of volunteers work under constant pressure. Observing lions in this environment requires a great deal of patience and cleverness. Gala Camp is the researchers headquarters. They're putting final touches on another tracking collar. The desperate cries of a baby buffalo from a mini disc are meant to attract the big cats. And just before midnight, six-year-old Romeo finally comes out of his hiding place. He weighs an impressive 170 kilograms, has wide shoulders, but unfortunately hasn't brought his usual harem of five females with him. He's been wearing a tracking collar for over a month. 
The $3,000 device records Romeo's movements through a satellite relay. Fecal samples, now in alcohol, can be analyzed both for DNA as well as for hormones. The male hormone, testosterone, may cause lions to become bald, just as it causes the same condition in men. The scientists will map out Romeo's wanderings, keeping a special eye on any forays into human territories. In three years' time, the researchers hope to understand and explain what makes these lions so different. Then, man and lion may have reasons to make peace. Located in the sandy outskirts of Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates, the government-funded Arabia's Wildlife Center is home to the world's largest collection of animals and birds indigenous to the Arabian Peninsula. A hundred thousand years ago, Elephants, lions and rhinos roamed from the Red Sea to the Gulf before climate changes made them extinct. The rock hyrax, a tree-loving animal that looks like a cross between a rabbit and a beaver, but which is a distant relative of the elephant, also lives here. Arabia's wildlife center and the adjoining breeding complex where many of the animals are born are the pet projects of Abdulaziz Abdullah al Midfa, Director General of Sharjah's Environment and Protected Areas Authority. The center is unique in that it's built in a way that the visitor feels that they are in a cage and that the animals are free. A dedicated conservationist and self-declared son of the desert, al Midfa vehemently declares that despite appearances, the desert is as rich an ecosystem as the rainforests of the Amazon and the Arctic tundra, and so it must be protected. The reptiles and rodents are kept in glass-fronted cages. Whenever possible, creatures at the center are let loose in largely open enclosures filled with rocks, pools, scrubs or sand, depending on their natural habitat. Birds sing or build nests on trees planted beside an artificial stream inside a large, well-lit room where hyraxes nap on top of a custom-made rocky outcrop. Sections of the center are kept dark during visiting hours, lighting up only when it's closed for the night. Although there are several different wildlife reserves in the Gulf, this is a zoo with a difference. For starters, there's the sheer variety that's brought this three-year-old center and Sharjah into national renown. It's the only member of the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria in the Middle East. Despite its relatively low profile, the Arabian Wildlife Center attracts at least 100,000 visitors a year. Few of these people have seen these animals in their natural environment. The aim is to pass a message that the desert has a lot of animals that must be conserved, protected and respected. Larger animals such as gazelles, ostriches, leopards and baboons are all located outside and can be seen from behind reinforced mirrored glass. Al Midfa hopes the center will raise people's awareness about Arabian wildlife, which would make his task of protecting them much easier. Jurassic Park is set in Japan showcasing the assembled fossils of more than 40 dinosaurs amidst a forest of giant ferns and other prehistoric greenery. Workers have spent days assembling towering dinosaur skeletons ahead of the opening of the world's largest dinosaur expo using cranes and other heavy equipment. The main attraction of the two-month event, which gathers dinosaurs and their parts from a dozen different countries under one roof, is the 35-meter Seismosaurus, a 50-ton herbivorous dinosaur which roamed the area which is now New Mexico in the United States 150 million years ago. The bones of the Seismosaurus were first discovered in the mid-1980s. 
paleontologists were able to find about 20% of the bone fossils and they spent a decade or so deducing from the parts found what the dinosaur looked like. The replica of the fossil skeleton took two years to make and was commissioned especially for this expo. In addition to the replica skeleton, the original fossils of the Seismosaurus were also on display. Ahead of the start of the expo, the dinosaurs were displayed to the media and select members of the public. Hundreds of men in business suits joined children who came to the expo straight after school to see the dinosaurs. The expo also has areas where visitors can have hands-on experiences. Some authentic dinosaur bones can be touched and even dug out of stone, just as at an excavation site. Seven-year-old Tamaki Inahata tried her hand at digging out bones using a hammer and chisel. And the gallery of visitors contemplated life in the Jurassic Age, 150 million years ago. For the past 18 years, orphan Gibbon Sumley has been confined to his small rusty cage inside a house on the outskirts of Bangkok. But recently Sumley was finally granted freedom by officers of the Wild Animal Rescue Foundation of Thailand, after his owners decided they couldn't look after him anymore. Sumley spent his entire life in captivity, imprisoned inside the sealed cage. His owners feared he might escape and attack other people. The floor of his cage is littered with milk cartons and energy drink bottles, signs of the unnatural diet he's had to put up with since he was captured. Officials from the Wild Animal Rescue Foundation, or WAR, spent an hour cutting through the rusty metal bars of Sumley's cage before taking the gibbon to their shelter in Bangkok. Currently, there are five gibbons under WAR's care. The organization is hoping to release all of them into a bigger enclosure in Phuket where the group runs a Gibbon project. Each week, people call the war office wanting to give up Gibbons and other wild animals that they can no longer care for. Annie Olive Croner, who manages an animal sanctuary in Kenya, walked through the arrival lounge at Kenya's Nairobi airport recently carrying Z, a two-year-old chimpanzee. Z had been through a lot of stress, moving from owner to owner and from shop to shop, until eventually he was part of a pair of chimps confiscated from a trade shop by the United Arab Emirates government. The other chimp died. High-ranking officials from various conservation groups in Kenya met Annie and Z at the airport upon their arrival. Similar to other chimpanzees around the world, Z is an endangered species. Many conservationists blame the bushmeat trade for threatening the survival of about 200,000 remaining chimpanzees in Africa. 17-year-old Gus has had a lot of attention throughout his time at Central Park Zoo in New York. The infamous creature was branded neurotic, paranoid, even bipolar. But now keepers have finally made him happy. The secret behind this bear boost is a new water whirling device called Endless Pool. It churns up the water of the normally tranquil pool, creating a fun current to play in. Before the new spa treatment, Gus would often act strange, worrying keepers with his endless and sometimes frenetic swimming back and forth. Gus's new toy is a big hit, turning him into a more playful bear. It arrived just in time for the blistering summer weather. The unit was a $25,000 gift from Endless Pool, and the zoo had to raise a further $25,000 to install the high-tech device. For youngsters visiting the zoo, it was a relief to see this once neurotic New York bear act the fool. Playful Gus delighted visitors by swimming with a bucket on his head, as if to prove his newfound lease on life. It seems now the only thing keeping Gus from fooling around in bubbles is not depression, but love. It's mating season for polar bears, and Gus was rather keen on following around his enclosure partner, Ida. A wild boar, 
which was orphaned when hunters killed its mother, has found a new family, a herd of cows. The pig arrived in early spring and got a warm welcome from the cows at Andre Villard's farm near Rouen, northwestern France. The young boar, about 10 months old, takes milk from the cows, but they have to lie down because he's too short to reach the teats. Farmer Andre Villard stressed that the wild boar probably suffered a lot and was not as developed as it should be for its age. He added that the young boar was now nearly domesticated. Every day, onlookers come to Villiard's farm to have a look at the strange animal living peacefully with a herd of cows. Luscious lady lynxes seek foxy felines for fun, frolics and a spot of mating in a bid to save the species from extinction. Conservationists in Jerez de la Frontera, Spain, might soon have to resort to these Lonely Hearts adverts in an attempt to save the critically endangered Iberian lynx. The Spanish government is providing 8 million euros worth of funding in an effort to save one of its national emblems. But with only two self-sustainable lynx populations left in the wild, in the scrubland of the Danana National Park on Spain's southern coast and in the Sierra Morena Mountains 200 kilometers to the north and lynx is very hard to find, trying to increase the lynx's population is a new, particularly difficult challenge. The Iberian lynx has been decimated by deforestation, hunting and the virus myxomatosis that wiped out huge numbers of rabbits, the lynx's favorite food. Aura and Saliga, two brown bundles of fur, spend their time feasting on thrice daily rations of rabbit and playing with the zoo's vet, Jose Maria Aguilar. Each little bigger than a kitten, they seem unaware of the arranged match ahead or that the responsibility of an entire species rests with them. Jerez Zoo is also home for three tiny red pandas, several very smelly and very rare European bison and a flock of bald ibises, one of the world's most endangered birds. The zoo's hopes for the lynx's proliferation now lie with finding an appropriate mate with sufficient genetic difference from the two female cubs that it already has in captivity. Three chubby white furballs stumbled into the hearts of Argentines recently when the Buenos Aires Zoo finally allowed the public to see the month-old white tiger cubs. The birth of the rare blue-eyed cubs, consisting of two females and one male, caused excitement in the conservation community. The importance of these births is that there are so few white tigers in the world, some 200 or 210, and the majority live in zoological gardens and reserves. The white tiger can be mainly found in the jungles of Asia. It's the largest of all feline jungle animals, weighing as much as 270 kilograms. Its agility and cunning make it an excellent hunter that can hide easily among the vegetation. However, the animals have been heavily hunted and less than 300 still exist. The majority of those are found in zoos and the Buenos Aires Zoo is the only one in South America that has white tigers. The cubs are still nameless, but children visiting the zoo in the next few days will vote on what to call them. And at a wildlife park in China, four lion cubs are four too many for their mother. She could only handle so many, and this quartet had to find a surrogate mum. As you can see, not another lioness, but this very beautiful and accommodating Dalmatian. The dog had given birth around the same time, and all but one of her litter had died. So, staff at the park asked her if she'd give it a try, and as you can see, sweet success. The cubs and the surviving pup are just like brother and sister, and everyone is happy. 
They say a leopard never changes its spots, but there's a spotty dog who can certainly change her ways. If you had to look at a picture of bliss, this would probably be it. Visitors to the park are all eager to be photographed with the lucky cubs. But some just want to cuddle anything that's cute. And if you're wondering about the names of the cubs, well, there's Lucky One, Lucky Two, Lucky Three, Lucky Four, Keepers at the San Diego Zoo are caring for a two-week-old red panda cub who was found abandoned by his mother in their habitat. The cub is said to be thriving now, but keepers were concerned when they first discovered him alone in his exhibit. They rushed the male cub to the San Diego Zoo's veterinary hospital. Smaller than the soft stuffed toy he clings to, the infant red panda has now regained his health thanks to his incubator and the puppy's milk he drinks from a bottle six times a day. He does little more than sleep or eat, though keepers say he's beginning to move around inside his incubator. The panda, who's just beginning to open his eyes, is expected to remain in the nursery for a few months. But zoo visitors can see him during visiting hours. The western lesser or red panda is found in the Himalayas and surrounding areas of Eastern Asia. Meanwhile, two giant pandas at the San Diego Zoo are experiencing a winter wonderland in sunny Southern California. Zookeepers have pumped summer snow made from 18 tons of crushed ice into the panda's living area. For Shishi, the elder of the two giant pandas, the snow may have been a familiar reminder of his homeland, China. However, for California native Huai Mei, the unseasonable snow seemed to be an intriguing treat for a warm summer day. The summer snow is part of an ongoing enrichment program at the zoo designed to provide animals with stimulating environments and activities. The snow is something different, but keepers say the bear's positive response may keep the white stuff coming back. We'll see you next time. Such as a